Welcome to lecture 2.3, Algebra of Linear Mappings. This lecture is going to mostly be definitions and some basic facts, a whole bunch of definitions, actually. And as such, it's kind of a misfit lecture. I could have put it right after the first lecture. I think probably all of the content could have been presented there. And I also could just not do it at all and add these definitions as they come up throughout the class. But I think because there's a common theme, it's worthwhile to introduce them all at once. And I'm not 100% sure that we will use all of these things throughout the class, but why not put it right here? It fits in our topic of linear maps. Okay, let's get started. First, we can add linear maps together and multiply them by scalars in the obvious way. Now we gave these definitions for linear scalar functions a couple lectures ago, but the idea is the same way here. If s and t are linear maps from x to u, then t plus s is their sum, and that's defined on a vector x to be tx plus ts. And similarly, a times t for some scalar is a linear function defined on a vector x to be t of a times x. It's easy to show that the set of linear maps from x to u is a vector space. Sometimes we write this as hom from x to u or as a script L from x to u. I think I'm going to stick with hom because it's probably the most common. This comes from well, you think it would come from homomorphism, but it actually comes from category theory, which is a very general setting of where you have objects and you have morphisms between them. And the morphisms represent like abstract structure preserving maps. And the sets of morphisms are denoted HOM in that setting. I will leave the following as homework. It's very simple to show that if you have a linear map T from X to U, and s from u to v, then their composition is linear. And moreover, the composition is distributive with respect to addition. So in other words, if we have linear maps p and t from x to u, and r and s from u to v, then r plus s of t equals r of t plus s of t. And s of t plus p is s of t plus s of p. So here, function composition behaves just like you would expect multiplication to behave if these are matrices or even if these are numbers. Several remarks. Usually, instead of writing S of t, we just write S times t. And if we think of these as linear maps, then we should read these from right to left. So doing t, then S. In general, S t is not equal to t s. And of course, there's many cases when t s is not even defined. For example, we need the range in the domains to match up. And I will not say how. I think it should be straightforward for you to verify how they need to match up. Since a linear map is a function, it is invertible if it is one to one and onto. In the setting of linear maps, this is equivalent to it being an isomorphism. We denote the inverse by t to the minus 1. Now, I should say that I have used this notation to refer to something else. Remember, I have used t inverse of v for a subspace, or really just a subset would work too, as the set of all vectors x in big X. Oh, I should say t. We're still assuming goes from x to u such that tx is in v. So this is the pre-image. Now, again, in this setting, this is not a map, but this is assumed to be a map. Um, I should say that when t is invertible, then we can talk about the pre-image. Well, then the pre-image of any element is just a one element set. And in this case, the pre-image of a single element or the inverse image of a single element is the pre-image. So in some sense, you can think of this as generalizing this notation 
That said, this is always a map when it's defined, and this is a, it is a, a set. If t is invertible, then t, t inverse is the identity. Now, it's a little bit weird that we say these things from left to right, t, t inverse, but we compose them from right to left, t inverse t, but that's just the way things go. We compose functions right to left, and we write English from left to right. So one way to think about this is suppose t goes, is a map from x, let's write it like this, x to u, and then t inverse goes from u to x, then here, t, t inverse, again, we're going right to left, means that we are starting here, and then we are going this way, and then that way. So we are starting and ending up here, and we get the identity map, and it's not hard to show just by symmetry that similarly, t inverse t is the identity map as well. That's the one where you start at x, and then you do t, and then you do t inverse. So if t is invertible, then it doesn't matter where you start. If you do t and t inverse in either order, you get the identity map. It is also straightforward to show that if a linear map is invertible, then its inverse is linear. And also that if s and t are, are invertible and s, t is defined, then the, that composition is invertible and its inverse is t inverse, s inverse. So the picture you should have in your mind with this, which you likely already do, is that if we do t and then we do s, now that composition is s t, and then the and if both of these are invertible, suppose s inverse is here and t inverse is here, then the composition of this, so the if you want to undo t then s, you do s inverse then t inverse. So this is t inverse s inverse. And I know it's annoying writing writing these, saying these left to right, but we're really composing them right to left. But it's a small price to pay. I think we can get used to it. Let's do some examples. I'm starting at example nine because I'm continuing this over this series of lectures in this section. So if x and u and v are all the set of polynomials in T over R, or really over any field, then let T be DDT, the differential operator, and S be the operation that multiplies a polynomial by T. Both of these are linear, and obviously the order matters. Next, suppose X, U, and V are, are all R3, so three-dimensional space, and let S be a 90 degree rotation around the X1 axis and T a 90 degree rotation around the X2 axis. Once again, all of these are linear and ST is not equal to TS. I'll let you think about which are invertible. I'll start with, with T. So T is not gonna be invertible because if you take the, the derivative of a constant function, like two, you get zero. So that's not going to be invertible. Um, think about s. So if you multiply by t, well, the inverse you'd have to divide by t, but think about if that's something that, that is a operation that's defined on the entire set of polynomials. So you, know, you can take t squared plus t, and you can certainly multiply by t, and you get t cubed plus t squared, and then you can divide by t, but that you're going to run into trouble if you try to divide some polynomials by t, like a constant polynomial. Um, and I think it should be clear that s and t are, are both going to be invertible. You just rotate the other direction. On this slide, I'm going to give you a bunch of definitions that are more algebraic in nature. So they might come up in a setting of groups or rings or modules. And they may or may not come up in the rest of this course. I'm not sure. But it's worth seeing them anyways because you could encounter them if you read about linear algebra and other sources. So it's worth putting them in one place. And this is probably the most appropriate place. 
So first, an endomorphism of X is just a linear map from X to itself. There's a number of ways that we can write this. I usually just say a set of endomorphisms that I'm, though I might write hom from X to X or L from X to X or just end of X. Now the set of linear maps between any two vector spaces is a vector space. So it's no different if we let U and X be the same, but we get more in this case because now the domain and codomain are the same. So we can compose linear maps, which we can think of as like multiplying. I say multiplying because if we think of these as matrices, as we will do soon, you know, we can take two square matrices and multiply them. So this is like a vector space, but with extra structure. So we are able to multiply these elements, which we think of as vectors. And when we have a vector space where multiplication of vectors is allowed, that's called an algebra. Moreover, this particular algebra is associative, which just means that A times B times C equals A times B times C. It's non-commutative because A, B is not always equal to B, A. And it has unity, which is just a fancy way of saying a multiplicative identity. And so that means it satisfies UX, sorry, IX equals X for all vectors X. So this looks like something that it should have, but not all algebraic structures have unity. One example is the even integers. And this is not a vector space, but it, it is a ring. You can add and you can subtract and you can multiply even integers. Um, so this is, is a nice algebraic structure, but it does not have a number satisfying this property because it does not contain one. The set of endomorphisms contains what we call zero divisors. These are pairs of linear maps whose composition is zero, but neither S nor T are zero. So if you're thinking of matrices, you've, you've seen that zero, or that you, you can definitely get two matrices that are non-zero that multiply to be the zero matrix. Now, this is contraband terminology. We have not introduced this. So if you want to do it purely in terms of linear maps, you can think of S is the linear, take a two dimensional vector space, X sends X1 to X1 and X2 to zero and T sends X1 to zero and X2 to X2. If you could combine these, you will get the zero map, though neither of these are zero. Next, I'll leave this as a proposition. It's fairly easy to show that if you have an endomorphism A, that is a left inverse of another one B, it just means that AB is the identity, then it is also a right inverse. In other words, BA is the identity. Now the notion of a left and right inverse exists because there are settings when one of these does not apply the other. One of the ones you may have seen is if you have two matrices of different sizes, so suppose I'm not going to even write out the sizes, but something like this, maybe they multiply to get the identity like, like this, but in the other order, well, in this particular case, this is, this is just not going to be defined at all. So sometimes you have something as a left inverse, but um, the other order the composition, it just does not work. But that's not going to be the case in endomorphisms. AB being the identity means that BA is as well. And it's not hard to see that I think if you draw a picture or something like this, if you do A and you do B, it doesn't matter what order you, if you do, if you start with, with one of these and, and say do B then A and get where you started with, then if you go start here, you do A and B, you get the same thing. But I will let you verify that. The invertible endomorphisms form the general linear group denoted GLN of K, where N is the dimension of X. So this is something that in maybe an early linear algebra course, you might see uh, as representing the set of N by N invertible matrices. So it's called linear. Well, it's called a group because um, it is a group under multiplication because everything is invertible. It's called linear because 
all of the elements are represent linear maps and it's called general because it is the largest such group of endomorphisms. There's a lot of other ones. There, there are these, there's a special linear group which represents all the ones that have determinant um, one. There's a lot of variations of this. There's ones that have determinant plus, you know, plus or minus one or norm one. If we're over the complex numbers, there's the orthogonal linear group, the I'm sure there's unitary ones, normal, there's uh, projective linear groups, and probably a lot more special unitary. I do a Google search on the types of, of these things. They, they come up in a lot of different areas, especially in more algebraic fields like ring theory or modules or Lie groups. And I don't know if we're going to use this terminology throughout the class, but it, it is central enough that it, it is worth mentioning. Now, the concept of an invertible endomorphism will come up throughout this class. And that's especially because every such one, let's call one S, defines a so-called similarity transformation of the space of endomorphisms. In other words, this is a map, a bijection that sends some linear map M to the conjugate S, M, S inverse. And sometimes that is written M sub S for short. Other times it is written M and then S is an exponent. I don't like either of these. I think it's, it's easier just to see S, M, S inverse. So I'll usually write that. Um, in this case, we say that the linear maps M and S, M, S inverse are similar. You've likely seen similarity in the context of an undergraduate linear algebra course. Um, we can talk about what matrices being similar means. We will see that soon. Uh, similar matrices have a lot of the same properties. They have the same eigenvalues, the same determinants. And actually, we will see in a few lectures that they actually represent the exact same linear map, just under a change of basis. So this is something that we will see later when we study uh, spectral theory, and we see Jordan canonical form and rational canonical form and a lot more things as well. Okay, so even though we won't study the general linear group in this class per se, um, invertible linear transformations or invertible uh, endomorphisms will play an important role throughout this class. Every similarity transformation or transform is an automorphism. This is a new definition, which is an endomorphism that is also bijective. So in other words, it's a structure preserving bijection of the set of endomorphisms. And when I say it's, an, it's structure preserving, I mean that the following three properties hold. If you conjugate, and by the way, I, I will use conjugate as a verb, um, Km, then you just get K times the conjugate of M. If you conjugate M plus N, then you get the sum of the conjugates of M and N. And if you conjugate MN, then you get the product of the conjugates of M and N. So let me actually write this down. Oh, I should say one more thing. So it follows from this that the set of similarity transforms, forms a group um, under the following composition. So if, if I take M and then I, con if I transform, or I'm gonna still say conjugate, if I conjugate by S and then by T, then that's the same as conjugating by TS. So this is called the inner automorphism group of GLN of K. And this is more of an algebra thing. Um, in group theory, you learn about inner automorphisms. And basically, there's a lot of structure preserve of the, there are in general, a lot of structure preserving maps um, from a space to itself called automorphisms, whether we talk about groups or rings or fields or something like this or vector spaces or al algebras. Um, not all of them are conjugations like this. So the ones that are, are form a, 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 sub, um, a subgroup called, the, called inner automorphism. So in group theory, there's something called outer automorphisms as well. So if you have a group um, that's abelian, so multiplication always commutes, 
and you have g and you conjugate it, x, g, x inverse, then you always get g back. But there are certainly a lot of structure-preserving maps of abelian groups. So for example, if you take the abelian group um, Z3, which is 0, 1, and 2, so you can think of this as 0, 1, 2, um, then one structure preserving map if it is, is sending 1 to 2, so you can think of, there's nothing special about 1, it generates the entire group. Likewise, 2 will generate the entire group as well, so the map that sends 1 to 2 is an automorphism, it's a structure preserving map, it's a way to rewire this group, but it's not a conjugation because conjugating uh, any element in a abelian group um, is going to just preserve it. And now I'm, I'm being a little bit sloppy because here I'm using multiplication, whereas here in Z3 I'm using addition. So, so technically conjugation in, in addition would be x plus g minus x, which is, is g. But if, if you didn't come here for group theory and you don't know groups, that's fine. You can ignore what I just said. Let me actually prove this, this up here. So these fancy looking statements, let's see why these are true. Um, well, this, I can actually, I'm gonna try to do these up here. So uh, if I have KM and I conjugate by S, that means S, S in, inverse. That's clearly equal to K times S, M, S inverse. I'm doing this quickly because it's straightforward. Here it's easy to show that S times M plus N, that's S inverse equals S, M, S inverse, which is that, plus S, N, S inverse, which is that. Okay, so we've verified this. And similarly here, S, M, N, S inverse. Nothing tricky about that. Well, this one is slightly trickier, I guess, because you have to do S, M, S inverse, S, N, S inverse. And notice that we've just multiplied this by the identity here. And if we group them this way, then we get that one here. Okay, so why does this form a group? Well, it, it contains the zero, or no, sorry, not the zero, it contains the identity, we have to be careful with that. The, the identity element in here is, is not the zero element, it's, it, it's a multiplicative identity. So in other words, if you take M, so the, the identity, um, if you take I, M, I inverse, where I is the identity, is that's just going to be M um, inverses. If I, so the, uh, I should actually probably say that using my notation in the previous slide, phi I is the map that sends M to I, M, I inverse, which is M. So for inverses, suppose we have phi um, S that sent, so suppose this is an inner automorphism. So this sends M to S, M, S inverse. Then I claim that the inverse of this map is phi S inverse, which sends M to S inverse M, S. So it's easy, it's easy to check that these are inverse maps. And finally, uh, for, for a group to hold, we need to show that the composition, uh, that if, if you have two inner automorphisms, so, um, so closure. Again, if you're a little bit shaky on, on this group theory, that's fine. This is more of an algebraic lecture, um, but it's worth showing this regardless. So if, if you have phi S, which is the transformation that sends M to S, M, S inverse, and you have phi um, T, which sends M to T, M, T inverse, then I claim that if you do S and then you do T, that's the same as doing T, S. So I, I, actually, I have to be careful with my notation because again, this whole reading left to right versus right to left business. So, so let's, let's uh, do these things back to back and see what we get. Um, so start with M. Let's first do phi S and we get S, M, S inverse. Then let's do phi T and then we get T, S, M, 
S inverse T inverse. And yes, indeed, this is what we get by doing phi T S because you, you can see that right there. So, so that's what it means to be a group. And the, this here is, is T S inverse. Okay, so that verifies this. Again, I don't know if we're gonna need this, but for those of you who have an algebra group theory background, it's, I think it's worth seeing. Okay, finally, a similarity is an equivalence relation. Remember, this is something you should have seen in your intro to proofs course. If not, or if you're rusty, that just means it is reflexive. So everything is similar to itself. It's symmetric. If L is similar to M, then M is similar to L. And finally, it's transitive. If L is similar to M, M is similar to N, then L is similar to N. And verification of these are, are, are basically the same as, as the proof of what we did up here. So reflexivity, this conjugate by the identity. For symmetry, if, if, uh, co if conjugating by S gets you from L to M, then conjugate by S inverse to go backwards. And finally, transitivity, if conjugating from L to M is, if S takes you from here to here, and T takes you from he here to here, um, then conjugating by, by well, th this here, TS takes you from here to here. Finally, we'll end with a slide of potpourri, just some miscellaneous definitions and examples. So first, if we have two endomorphisms, A and B, and at least one of them is invertible, then AB and BA are similar. Now, you may say, well, so what? Well, as we'll see later, something I've mentioned, and I know you've seen before, that similar linear maps, similar matrices, have the same eigenvalues, same determinants. So that means that doing these, it seems like you might get something very different if you do these in the opposite order. And in general, you do, but they still have some basic similarities between them. They're not completely unrelated. Next, somewhat unrelated to, I guess, Prop 2.7 anyways, is that given an endomorphism and a polynomial in T, we can take A and plug it into the polynomial and get a polynomial in A. Now, the only perhaps unusual thing you might look at this is the constant term turns into the identity map times a constant. You may say, well, why is that? Basically because both of these things are isomorphic algebraic structures. So they, so this is a commutative subalgebra of a set of endomorphisms. I should probably put this up. And this is a commutative algebra as well. Now there's some details I'm glossing over about when you can do this, and you got to be careful when you have multivariate polynomials. You got to be careful when you have power series. You know, if you plug this into a power series, you got to worry about convergence. Um, now, this will come up. You've likely, I know you've seen eigenvalues, or you should have, um, if you've taken an undergraduate algebra course. Um, those things are the roots of the so called characteristic polynomial. So, given a matrix, or more generally, given a linear map, you get a notion of a characteristic polynomial, a minimal polynomial, and then you get some, some neat results, like magically, these linear maps, if you plug them into these polynomials, you get zero. So it's like this is a root of this polynomial. Of course, by root, we just mean that we get the zero map. So these are things that we will understand later in this cl class. We have some very deep results involving this that really just seem like magic, but we will uncover them and, and see why they are true. And uh, so stay with us on that. Next up, um, a few definitions that I may or may not use throughout the class. I might as well mention them. They come, they come up a lot. Um, a projection is just any linear map that if you do it twice, you get itself. And in an algebra course, you might call this an idempotent map. Idempotent map is, is any function or any, I guess, in a ring or module, any element that if you square it, it's equal to itself. Of course, this should make sense if you think about projecting a, a vector onto a line. 
So if this is x and this, this is px, then if you project it again, you should get itself. So this comes up also a lot in statistics. If you, something like least squares or generalized least squares are basically just projections onto subspaces. Now, something that is more relevant to an algebra course, like a course in groups, rings, or modules, is going to be commutators. So the commutator of two endomorphisms, denoted with this bracket, bracket A comma B, is just AB minus BA. Now, this is obviously zero if A and B commute, and it's non-zero otherwise. So this is, in some sense, a way to measure how close A and B are to commuting. So in a group, the commutator of x and y is often called, using a bracket again, bracket x comma y, is x, y, x inverse, y inverse. This, of course, so here this is equal to 0 if and only if a and b commute. Here this is equal to the identity element of the group if and only if x and y commute. So it's a little bit different, but the same basic idea is this is somehow measuring how far these things are from commuting. And at least in group theory, if you, if you take the quotient by these things, you, you have killed off things that don't commute and you get an abelian group. So something that I probably don't think I'll use this in this class, but it is worth mentioning because you, know, you may see it in other contexts. Finally, we will finish with one example that I like because it is related to the topic of Fourier series, which I think is really fun. Well, actually, what I think is fun is the linear algebra behind that and the concept of a generalized Fourier series. So if you change the boundary conditions, you can get a basis of, of functions of that generalize what sines and, how sines and cosines um, form a basis for the periodic functions. So I have videos on this in my advanced engineering um, mathematics class. I encourage you to take a look. But basically, the gist is if you have um, the space of uh, continuous functions, say from R to R, then the following maps are projections. So P takes a function F and it sends it to f of x plus f of minus x over 2. And q takes a function and sends it to f of x minus f of negative x over 2. This is called the even part. This is called the odd part. So it's clear that f is just the sum of these two things. So we have decomposed every function into, oh, I should tell you what even and odd are graphically. So a function is even if it is symmetric about the x, or, sorry, the the y-axis. So, so this just says that if this is x and this is negative x, this just says that f of x and f of negative x are the same. So even means f of x equals f of negative x. Notice by construction, the even part is even. And then a function is odd if it is symmetric, this is harder to draw, about the I don't know if I did that. Okay, it's symmetric about the origin. I probably messed that up a little bit, but um, that just means that if you take um, x and negative x, then f of x is equal to, so f of x equals negative f of negative x. So notice that this is by construction an odd function. So this is that every function can be represented uniquely. Here's how to do it as an even part and an odd part. So common even functions, any, any polynomial or any monomial of the form x to the 2n is even, x to the 2n plus 1 is odd, any cosine wave is going to be even, any sine wave is going to be odd. And if you have a Taylor series and all of the, even, all of the odd terms are zero, you get an even function and vice versa. So this this is sort of the introduction to the notion of Fourier series representing periodic functions as sines and cosines. And that comes up all the time in engineering. They were basically invented to solve partial differential equations when the initial conditions were not sines and cosines, so they can handle any arbitrary functions. And well, you can tell this is a topic that I like a lot. And I have a number of videos on it. So instead of just rambling on this, I will refer you to those. 
Okay, so that's the end of it. Again, a little bit of a misfit lecture, but I think it's, it's worth throwing this in here so you have it. Some of the stuff will come up. And what we will do next is we will look at what's called the transpose of a linear map. And that basically generalizes the notion of the transpose of a matrix, but it, it's the abstract notion of it between, uh, for maps between any vector spaces. So stay with us.